deep conversations with Uli Bear on big ideas and great books. Um, hi, Glenn. I'm really excited to welcome back uh, Glenn Wallace today to the Think About It podcast. First of all, Glenn, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So, Glenn, uh, you were a guest on uh, Khalil Gibran's The Prophet a long time ago, actually. It's one of the first podcasts I did on books that have had uh, a really outsized influence. And now you've published uh, just right now a new book that's just out right now called Nietzsche Now, The Great Immoralist on the Vital Issues of Our Time. And I wanted to start us out by saying, uh, what moved you to write this book on Nietzsche, 19th century great philosopher, the end of Western metaphysics, possibly? Um, what motivated you to write this book? And then we'll dive right into the book, actually, um, to hear yeah. what, what you've done with uh, the Nietzsche that you've so so comprehensively read just about everything he's ever written, right? But this book actually has a very specific uh, origin. Uh, I remember the moment that it was conceived and discharged into the world. I was having a conversation with Mary Barr of Warbler Press, as you know, and she mentioned some, I don't know, when was this? Was this 2021, early 2022? Some hot cultural war issue. We were talking on the phone and um, and I had just been reading some Nietzsche and I, I made the comment, oh, Nietzsche would have some very interesting things to say about that point. And then we started talking about how how Nietzsche might actually be an interesting guide to thinking through super uh, charged hot button issues uh, of which we today in American society seem extremely reluctant to to even broach. Um, so that's how that 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 was the origin of it. Like oh, let me start looking through Nietzsche. Maybe we can do a reader. With with passages that seem relevant to the to this issue of how to you know have difficult conversations, and then it turned into no, let's just have a you know a full book on it with chapters. And I I just I just opened up my own no notebook in pre preparation for this, and I see we had originally something like fifteen different chapters with titles like individuation versus the state, gender, free speech, pronouns, authoritarianism, self help, and so on, um, but. You know, it ended up being many fewer chapters than that uh, for, for reasons which I'm sure we'll speak about having to do with the complexity of Nietzsche. Uh, but that, that's what really initiated it. And then, you know, as I started reading through Nietzsche, I, it's, his actual text, I started seeing like this, this, this guy really is an enemy of easy, quick answers to questions. Uh, the bigger the question, the the more skeptical he is, the more hesitant he is to come to to an answer. He uh, he also offers us some actual, you know, I would say fairly programmatic um, strategies for doing the kind of work of looking at looking at a question from multiple angles, considering it carefully. Um, he 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 thinks that that we need to cultivate certain dispositions to do that, like like courage, existential courage and and, and curiosity. And um I, I I I would say that's the motivation is is I wanted to to consider how how Nietzsche could serve as a guide to help us today in American society start thinking through issues that again like we're pretty paralyzed. Um, <laughs> Let's say in a general in a general um, way, the concerns you raise, and in the book they end up being quite specific. So democracy, identity, uh, perhaps kind of question of ideology or, or what's what's labeled wokeness, which you sort of question as a term. But you're saying there's a kind of um, unease right now in American culture, public culture, private conversations, and political culture of we don't quite know the way forward, and then. Um, you didn't write a book where you said Nietzsche has an answer here and there's another nugget we can pick out there. And here's a quote that responds to that. But you instead in the book, you kind of chart a path to say, let's first of all situate Nietzsche in his time. So you write this kind of very clear um, biographical sketch where you emphasize this is the sense I have of this human being in this particular moment, rather than all the things he did and didn't do. 
And then from there, you say it takes a bit of time to go through this actual process, not to jump toward a quote that said, oh, here's the answer to my problem that I faced this morning. But here's a way to learn how to think with Nietzsche. And you chart this kind of path through the book. So I think for the reader, uh, both very experienced Nietzsche scholars, and you've gotten some you know, endorsements from people who've studied Nietzsche for really decades, scholars, and also for new readers who are turning to Nietzsche. This is not a book to turn to and say, here's going to be your quick answer, but here's a way to actually learn how to come up with your own answers. So I'm curious how you sort of think of Nietzsche more as a, a guide, someone who carries us along, but would at some moment, and we'll get to that, also leave you by yourself. Like you have to sort of continue doing the work. He doesn't get you quite... He gets you to the step right before the answer you may find, but he doesn't really, he's not a, and you warn against this, you warn with other people to say, don't pick nuggets and quotes out of Nietzsche to sort of say he solved some problem for us, but he puts us on a way. Um, so, so maybe start like how you dealt with a biography and there's a very famous, um, well-known uh, remark by Martin Heidegger, the philosopher who in the 1930s taught these lectures on Nietzsche in the middle of, the Rise of Fascism, very complicated book. And he says, here's the biography. Nietzsche was born, he lived, and then he died. And now we're done with that, which is both insincere and also important because he says we shouldn't let the complicated life overshadow the philosophy. So how did you start the book by saying you wanted to give a sense of the person and why was that your intent? Why didn't you just also skip the whole biography? See, I don't want to deal with all the controversial or exciting titillating points, but I wanted to give give your reader a sense of who Nietzsche was. Yeah, I mean, those very astute co comments you just made. Um, yeah, I uh, I say at the very outset of that chapter on the biography that it's the sense of Nietzsche that I want to convey, and particularly my sense. And in, in doing so, I think I make, make it a very Nietzschean move. Nietzsche believes that philosophy is really kind of a form of autobiography that that when people philosophize they're, they're like he, he does this in a cruel kind of mean way with Kant that Kant's always coming to the conclusions that suit him best and suit his own disposition and lifestyle somehow he always ends up coming to the conclusions that serve Kant you know and uh so Nietzsche is very very sensitive to the relationship between thinking and self and body and you know sensibility and desire. Uh, Hegel famously said that uh, spirit is bone. Nietzsche goes even further, and he literally says spirit is stomach. And he 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 has this passage in Echeoma, one of his last works, where he says like we have to admit that uh, our dispositions have an all, awful lot to do with how we think about things. So you can't really from Nietzsche's perspective, understand a thinker without having a sense of the person. I, I don't necessarily, I wasn't necessarily interested in placing him in his own context, his own time, and trying to understand what he meant by whatever, you know, democracy ba based on his own time. Um, but I was very much interested in, in, in conveying a sense of who this man was as a human being. And that's why, for example, I have a lot of we have incredible uh, records from people um, talking about Nietzsche, and we have lots of students talking about how I was as a teacher. And I think that's an incredible way to get a sense of us. They say the funniest things about, you know, he's, he was such a character in the classroom, apparently. We know from that. And that's important to understand in his thinking. Well, it's important also, I think, that allows us to read all the texts and the, the the major books and you know you focus mostly on the published works although you draw on all the unpublished things that were published posthumously to say he's a teacher which means he is a guide to us as readers now because in some ways we are students and i i thought of one thing when you just said this who he was to himself so sue prido published this kind of really well-known um uh, biography, I Am Dynamite, A Life of Nietzsche, which won the Hawthorne End Prize, and a really interesting book. And that quote gives you one sense of Nietzsche. I am dynamite. I am a destiny. I am a thing to come. I am. And then you can fill in these words. He's kind of self-aggrandizing enormous terms. He is something larger than his own time, which may be why he's still relevant. And then there's also a 
strange strain of humility, say, I'm just trying this out. I'm not sure yet. You have to actually verify this for yourself. I'm giving you this way or this other option, but I'm not certain that this is really going to be the lasting answer, especially when he talks about, and you spend a lot of time on this, slowly unraveling what we understand as morality and why we've been, in his view, totally confused and deliberately confused of what mean what it does what it means to be good which is conformity and what it means to be evil which is to stand out and there's a complete misunderstanding but this combination of the hubris of Rilke and the humility in Rilke I'm kind of interesting how you made sense of that which maybe goes to the heart of what a teacher is did you say in Rilke or uh, I, did I say Rilke uh, uh, well yeah that's uh, Look on that's your brain. possible but it's I meant Nietzsche actually yes yeah again very very interesting you know <laughs> If you if you search the collected works online of Nietzsche, mask, search the word mask, you're going to find so many references. He uses oh. the word mask an awful lot. Also, even in the in the actual published works, the word mask comes uh, appears a lot. You know, Eke Homo is really really at the very end, and he he makes a comment somewhere in there. He's like, no no one's paying attention to me. I I have to pay to get my books published. I mean. The guy was basically self-publishing at the end because he was selling 300 copies of a book and the publisher said, I can't afford it. I mean, he had a legitimate publisher, but he was he was putting up the money. His, his friends were loaning him money, they were putting up the money. And they, no one's reading this. I might as well, I'd rather really, really just say it, how, how I feel it. It's kind of like the first, like, it's kind of like a rapper mentality in a way. Like you know, other people aren't going to say it about me. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it real directly. And I'm not, I'm not going to pull any punches or hold back. And um, and uh, my readers, you know, he talks a lot about his perfect readers and he, he says a lot of incredible things. He says, uh, when I imagine my per a perfect reader, they always turn out to be a monster of courage and curiosity. In addition, uh, they turn out to be something supple, cunning, cautious, a born adventurer and discoverer. His perfect readers, he thinks, will know what he's up to mm -hmm. because you're, you're absolutely right. He has this tremendously tender, soft, uh, uh, you know, uh, heart heartfelt, sensitive side. It also shows out. It shows up in the letters. It shows up in people reminiscing about him. Um, yeah, you know, maybe that's another another aspect of Nietzsche that makes him right for our times. <laughs> this capacity yeah. for both. Well, let's let's stay with some of these concepts, and it's sort of it's. It's, you know, we're going to go back to this sort of meat of the book. And I do want to ask you whether he does give us ultimately, maybe at the end of this podcast, some answers to some of our current dilemmas. But you've said uh, curiosity and courage are two qualities. And you have this kind of list at the end. There are six kind of um, stances or traits that we should actually cultivate in ourselves. And there may be innate, it does not really matter, but there's something we should. And so courage and curiosity, the first two. So what do you mean by that? And that both says something about Nietzsche himself and about yeah. us as what we could take from Nietzsche. Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up because we could have missed this. And this is an aspect of Nietzsche that is, you know, could be considered a way forward or kind of you know, somewhat programmatic in a sense. Although I should preface what I'm about to say uh, with the comment that he doesn't actually spell it out like this. I, I actually used a book by... A, a philosopher named Mark Alfano, who wrote a really fascinating book on the moral psychology of Nietzsche. But the way he went about it was uh, through a digital humanities process. What he did was he looked at he looked at the terms that appear in Nietzsche's works and, and with and the other terms surrounding them. So in context, and he maps this out. And he asks the question: If we had no more, if 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 we, if Nietzsche disappeared, could we reconstruct his philosophy from the secondary literature? Now we do have Nietzsche, so he can compare the secondary literature, do a digital uh, humanities analysis of the secondary literature and compare it to the uh, to Nietzsche himself. And his his conclusion is absolutely not. The secondary literature has concerns and emphasizes points and concepts you know, like the will to power, for example, that seem to be quite minimal in Nietzsche himself based on an actual textual analysis. So, uh, so I want to preface with that, but having said that, uh, all, all of these terms, according to Alfano, except for one of them, I can't forget which one it is. Uh, you, you add honesty. That's the one. That honest, I added honesty myself. 
Yes. Okay, because he, he, he uh, in other places, I, I seem to talk a lot about honesty or uh, redlichkeit, which is a fascinating term yeah. connected yeah. to Diogenes. And maybe we can talk about that. Uh, one way, to, I think, to translate that's honesty. And that seems to be very, very important with him. But so I put them together in a way that, uh, that are somewhat um, sequen sequential. So everything begins with curiosity for Nietzsche. And 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 good and I I think you can construct a good argument that that there's something to this sequence, although Nietzsche of course never really spells it out. But he will say in, in several places things like it all begins with curiosity. If you're not curious about what's going on around you, you're going to remain this this camel that he talks about in Zarathustra. This load he just had, is loaded down by the ideology of of society and so forth. Curiosity is what opens opens up your eyes and gets you thinking about why things are the way they are. Could they be different and so forth? And wait, now, can I say? But, can I stay with one thing? I think what yes. you did, which I really liked, I said, curiosity is. You could say that leads to a skeptical attitude, a critical attitude to philosophy. But it's also for him. Nietzsche says we are curious because we love the world because it is this abundance of things and events and happenings and people. So in some ways, it's both. So the skepticism of Nietzsche, and he's known as the great you know, the deconstructor of Western metaphysics, it's paired, and I think he works very hard to make you understand, this is not in the name of taking things apart for its own sake. So it's not criticism as negative, pointing out all the flaws. And there, there could be an easy misreading to say, oh, Nietzsche just says there's a fault with that. Democracy is hypocrisy. Christian morality is actually not really good for people. He says, I'm doing this in order to reassemble or leave you the pieces actually exposed that we are so attached to. And so curiosity is both, you're curious about the world, how it functions, because you want it to actually be as rich as possible. And we overlook it, right? Absolutely. I think that's very important to mention. Nietzsche doesn't do, he doesn't engage in a deconstruction, a critique of the world just for the sake of doing that, of exposing the idiocy of things. It's and I, and I have to I have to yeah. say, out of deference to my uh, beloved late teacher Jacques Derrida, I use deconstruction in a very sloppy sense because yeah. Jacques Derrida, who was one of the many people who, but really instrumental in coining that term, he also would have said deconstruction means to not just take apart for the sake of taking. Yes, apart. yes, yes. And then we go to the next one. So honesty is the next one in a kind of. It's not a sequence, but they are these kind yeah. of. And what do you call them, like traits to develop? Oh, oh, well, that's actually a very difficult and important question. Um, Nietzsche talks about the importance of creating values, uh, you, know, re -val you know, creating values. He talks about the importance of something he wants to call virtue, but he's very quick to add. He means virtue in the Renaissance sense. He doesn't mean virtue that's been affected by... Christian morality. Mm -hmm. So I ended up calling the virtues. At first, I wanted to call them virtuosities, uh, because really they're the kinds of that's what they are. They're they're, they're traits or dispositions uh, that we've developed to the point of, of a kind of fluency. Like whether you're playing piano or language, you become a virtuoso in these things. But I ended up calling them virtues. It, it's a little problematic because a lot of times Ver Nietzsche's you know talk is considered a virtue ethicist, and that, that's problematic because he's actually. He's very he's very cautious about the notion of virtue because he thinks it's tinged with a, a moralism that he doesn't. But like. I like virtuosity. It's yeah, what we said. I like it too. So if you develop curiosity, and the next one is honesty, to the to the point of as if it's a language you speak with enormous fluency. So you don't think about honesty all the time as something you're striving for. You're just honest. And so what does what do you mean by honesty here? Toward what? Yeah, that, that's a great that's a great question. Um, I know why I, 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 I worked honesty in. At the time I was reading, I started reading. I read very, very little, I have to say, secondary literature worlds where I tried to avoid it as a matter of fact. Again, not not out of any particular principle, just but because I thought <laughs> that's what Nietzsche was asking me to do. He, he's asking me to read him and to read him very, very carefully. Uh, he, he, said, he says this, it's very interesting. He says, if if the task uh, if if my text is incomprehensible to anyone, and grates on the ears, the fault I think does not necessarily lie with me. Uh, it, it is clear enough, assuming as I assume that the reader has read, has first read my earlier works and uh, spared no effort doing so. I'm trying to read my own handwriting, so that that's why I didn't read many secondary works. But 
there was one point uh, I did start reading a secondary uh, text, and that was a text by a philosopher, a German uh, Nietzsche scholar named Vanessa Lem, who writes on uh, this passage in Nietzsche called uh, on Homo Natura, the translating the human back into nature. And a major theme in this translation of the human back into nature, which is something Nietzsche wants to do, human is animal, human is plant, in, in a very real and important sense, uh, is this notion of honesty. Uh, it's Redlichkeit in German, which has a uh, has an element of honesty as something that's spoken. You can't just be honest in your mind, like sitting in the, the faculty meeting and people saying all kinds of nonsense and you just sit there and take it. No, honesty is, is, to, is also an action involving a form of speech. Uh, Vanessa Lim makes that very clear. And she starts, uh, she makes a very good case, I think, of, of uh, linking Nietzsche's notion of honesty, Redlichkeit, to people like Diogenes uh, and the cynics. So I'm, I, I have, it's very interesting. Let me go from, wait, yeah. let's, from honesty to courage, what you just said, the example. There's, yes. there's one example would be to speak out in a group setting where you are more worried about your peer's opinion than actually what you really think to be right. true, to be true. So courage is the next one, um, but it's not quite that Nietzsche, I think, makes us into these be a revolutionary for its own sake. So it's courage in the name of an an honesty, right? And yes, so yes. What what does courage mean uh, in this in this setting here? Like it's not courage. It's yeah. I'm just curious what you think. Well, I mean, so so it's so I use this example of being in in you know a conference at at your workplace because constantly throughout the book, I'm saying okay, let's take this large idea and not think about how it can apply to the world as a whole, but start off by thinking how it applies to you in your own you right. know, situation, some micro situation. Uh, so in in such a micro situation, you could say um, that that courage is is the capacity to actually act on what your curiosity is revealing to you. There's a really yeah. nice line I quoted in the book from um, Sarah Ahmed, who writes about the, the killjoy, the feminist killjoy. Are you familiar with that concept? Yep. And she says, so the killjoy is someone who's always going to ruin Thanksgiving dinner because you know the uncle's making a misogynist joke, and the killjoy, he or she is going to call out this this behavior because this this is the the, the locus of of change really uh, it, as long as you call it out and she says and I, I think it, it, I think I think this has very much to do with uh, all of what we're talking about to do here it has a lot to do with Nietzsche's notion of nobility but um, Ahmed says the person who acts in this way who speaks out is is acts in a way that is quote is to open a life to make room for a life, to make room for possibility, to make room for chance and change. And I think that that's where the courage comes in. Like you can have curiosity and you can have honesty, but it can remain internal or it could be it could be it could be offered over in some soft, you know, uh, inoffensive way that doesn't really do the work that needs to be done. Courage is an inner disposition or virtue, Nietzsche will call it, and somewhat Aristotelian sense, I guess. Uh, the more you practice it, the more you have it. Eventually, it becomes fluid. Not it's being crazy. afraid to say the thing because you you will lose. You will lose. You there's a lot to lose in speaking out. And, and this it goes to the next uh, of these what do you call virtues or virtuosities? The pathos of distance. And pathos maybe has a kind of you know for us pathos sounds usually something overwrought, overdone. I think it's also supposed to mean pain in the sense of the passions of the senses. So the distance is you will separate yourself in a way from even people you love, care about, and respect. And it's not a matter of it's so easy that, oh, you read Nietzsche and then you know what's true and all these fools are deluded. It's actually what he says. This, you have to be honest enough to actually separate yourself from people who you really are very close to. So the point is not the easy one to say, oh, I disagree with those people because they're fools and they're they're, they're taken in by something but this pathos of distance, can you say a bit about that? Because you say it's not exactly, it cannot produce joy right away. It's not, I'm so proud because I'm, you know, the smartest person here and I figured it all out. I think you're absolutely right. It's, I think it's really, it, it, it points to Nietzsche's care 
and subtlety when he when he when he when he introduces the term pathos. You know, that's some you're right, that's pain. It hurts to realize that you know, you know, that that you're somehow separated. There, there, there are reasons that separate you from other people that are that are deep consequential reasons. Um and and you're absolutely right. It, it has to do with the realization that this is again, this is going to go to his critique of democracy and, and equality, which is very painful to, for us to read about, but he thinks that they're problematic because you know, again, you can look at a job situation and you can ask the question whether people do not separate themselves out based on abilities, capacities, effort, or and so forth. He thinks it's necessary for us to start to realize that, that this is the case. And it is a pathos because it's painful to realize this. It's not a pleasant thing. So you might read Nietzsche and come to all these incredible insights about how to get on with life and, th and really wish that you hadn't read them. It's, it's yeah. And we can go right to the, to the next one, the next one from Pathos of Distance, which is also maybe, and maybe that is still, you know, a remnant, which of course he disagrees and agrees with other philosophers, but Kant also has this idea that you need to have some kind of distance from the things you're observing. Hannah Arendt will draw a lot on that in her later work. And then you go from Pathos of Distance to solitude. You will be alone. And if you can explain that and then we'll go back. I want to go back to a comment you just made about identity and democracy because you deal with both of those topics um, explicitly in the book. But solitude is the stance that, and when you read that, I mean, do you feel this is a kind of defense of solitude or sort of like a sort of explanation that's necessary part of life or how does- I, I mean, it... I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Well, I mean, a very Nietzschean, since it's it's it becomes a kind of necessity it flows like i think that there's a sequence here that you know solitude follows from pathos of distance this you start realizing there's difference in distinction so he talks about solitude also in terms of the contemplative and the scientist that in order for them to do the work so, something like solitude is required it's not only a solitude of of, of the body it's, it's it's a solitude it's kind of like what the ancient Greeks talk about epoche, like a removal of bracketing out of the stresses and concerns and harassment of the world. So you can do a certain kind of thinking, a certain kind of work. That that of necessity follows in this pathos of distance. You're starting to realize you are different. There are differences and the solitude becomes a, a necessary, becomes an aspect of, of, of figuring out what to do. I, if I can, I'll, I'll give our listeners here a, a moment because the book is actually a kind of patient reading with Nietzsche. And you make a point to say, I'm using a lot of direct quotation. So you get a sense of this, this man's thinking. And so you write about solitude here. It is absolutely crucial to understand that solitude for Nietzsche is not an escape from the world. Nietzsche's affirmation, his yes saying, does not entail aloof acquiescence to the way things are. To do so would be to engage in passive nihilism. Solitude is the means to remedy the fact that the vita contemplativa, time for thinking and calmness in thinking is missing from our lives, together with, with its lamentable consequence that no one considers dissenting views anymore, one is content merely to hate them. So in some ways, you actually don't give yourself the time to even think about the things you disagree with, because there's maybe a comfort to say, I totally disagree with it, I don't even want to think about it. And I think I don't want to think about it, to be honest, either with views I really disagree with. But I do think in order to live my life fully, I need to engage with these views, partly to understand where people are coming from, partly to not fall prey to them, and partly to avoid the fact that I'm actually not thinking when I just judge things like that so quickly. It's very much tied to his idea of intellectual conscience, which is an extremely important idea. And it, 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 there's a very long passage. And we actually kept it in twice because it's so important. We read it. We, I say we because I, I feel like I did this book with Mary, you know. Um, yeah. And um, um, so solitude is a part of what intellectual conscience is. Just what you said is like he's Nietzsche's like I, the thing that drives me no, most crazy. My biggest pet peeve is that people can't give reasons for their beliefs or their opinions. They just refuse to do it, and when really pressed. They're not really reasons at all. And, 
you know, if we, it, it's painful to think, and, and Nietzsche is constantly saying the truth is hard, let's don't be precious. But, you know, I say throughout the book that something might strike us as reactionary or conservative or, you know, problematic in certain ways. But then I always follow that by, in a very Nietzschean way, saying, but does that necessarily make it wrong? You know? <laughs> Yeah. Partly where you start out by saying when it drives you crazy, people can't give reasons, or people give reasons that they're not really reasons. And, and I was I was saying that Nietzsche is saying that. Yes. In his, in his, and yeah. You follow Nietzsche, and Nietzsche would say something in you know Beyond Good and Evil and Genealogy of Morals. He says something like, "We have to be a little bit more careful to accept morality because it's been ingrained and it's established to institutions and otherwise, and our own in, internalized values." But usually what is considered a moral value or moral good is just self-serving and serving a certain group. And then he flips that and he says, you would think that it would just benefit the group of the powerful. It's easy to understand that. So the elite sort of creates some value system that benefits them and protects their status. But he says, what's really much more upsetting is that the disenfranchised, the weak, they actually also have a value on their side. And there he goes into this whole reversal where we're thinking, well, the oppressed, they have no recourse to setting up values, anything, but the, he said they get this enormous benefit out of overvaluing their own state, which he calls resentment. And there he anticipates entirely Michel Foucault, yeah. who says, we have to be careful to just keep locked in our oppressive oppressor schema and then say, let's put morality under that. He said, morality works in favor of both sides, which is really confusing. And I interviewed and Stolo, the anthropologist on, on Foucault, and she kind of explained what this is. So when Nietzsche says, the truth is often in the service of something rather than in, in the service of actually the world or what he calls reality, our lives. So you also have this kind of, um, what you said, your pet peeve. Nietzsche was also bothered that people couldn't give him yeah. the reasons for believing. So what that they was Nietzsche's pet peeve. It's Nietzsche's pet peeve. Yeah, okay. That's Nietzsche's yeah. pet peeve. He's like, he says, uh, how does he put it? He says, um, uh, nobody blushes with shame when you let it be known that their weights are underweight. They, they, um, nor, nor, um, what I want to say is that the vast majority of people do not consider it contemptible to believe this or that and to live accordingly without first becoming aware of the final and most certain reasons for and against, and without even troubling themselves about such reasons afterwards. Uh, so, um, again, going back to the, the business of, of solitude, that, that's a place where we can start. Uh, not only solitude, not only with oneself, you can have solitude with another person in the sense that you're you're exploring these issues within this epoch of you know removing yourself from the usual positions and so forth. Yeah, that, that, uh, that's really interesting what you say about morality. And of course, Nietzsche will even, that might be one of the reasons why Nietzsche wants us to, to get rid of morality altogether because it's always going to do, morality is that which does a certain kind of work uh, for the benefit of certain, you know, groups of people, and it's but never anything but that. The, the the first person to write a book in English on Nietzsche is H. L. Mencken, yeah. who was a towering <laughs> figure, super famous now, pretty much largely forgotten, except outside of sociology and journalism. But I did this podcast on Mencken, on his book Notes on Democracy, where he says basically, democracy is this great delusion that we think the oppressed in quotation marks have an innate thirst for freedom and will actually liberate themselves and others and he said no they have a need for security for power and once they get it they will actually oppress the next group which is a very sobering and depressing insight and no one really wants to have that insight because we don't want to judge people we don't want to feel and this and Nietzsche doesn't leave your position to feel superior he says you yourself are invested in this as much as the people you're now sort of looking down upon and I think this is the the, dy the dynamism of his work. He doesn't leave you a position from which to then judge. So you have this other quote, and we should mention that the, 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 the last virtue or virtuosity you add, and it's very important for you, it ends the whole book, is the sense of humor. That Nietzsche is <laughs> the great ironist, but it's not irony in a kind of you know super Germanic way of like, I can say things and mean something else. He's actually funny. Yeah. And he says, for example, yeah. many people have needed the humility to say, I believe this because it is absurd, sacrificing their own reason. But no one, as far as Nietzsche knows, has taken the one step further to the humility that says, I believe because I am absurd. <laughs> yeah. and, and this is a strain that I encountered when I was 
you know, reading Nietzsche first to the, especially I think the feminist philosophers, Sarah Kaufmann and people uh, and women like that, who actually saw the irony and the humor in Nietzsche as a way out of sort of thinking of the world, they are the oppressors and the oppressed, and we can't get to them really. You said that the first thing to do is use humor, not the only thing, but one of the oh, things. Yeah. You know, I maybe we come back to the humor point, but you just raised a very interesting point, which is which is an important moment in writing this book. At some point, I felt like, oh my God, like what have I got myself into here? Because there was a chapter on identity, and Nietzsche was saying some things that yeah. I thought, oh, my readers are never going to accept this. And then I I noticed there was there was a, a a group of radical feminist philosophers who actually used. I think Wendy Brown had a reference that were yeah. using this Nietzschean passage that seems so terrible to me about about identity and and how it just identity identity uh, categories or just perpetuate the oppressions of the people who, who want to claim them. It, you know, I was reading about, you know, feminists thinking about, you know, uh, you know, what is it? Um, what is it? The, uh, the, the not the everyday is politics. What's the, the, the saying? The private is the political. Yeah, so the personal is the political. The personal, right? the personal is the political. Yes. And then I discovered, OK, so, you know, not not that I wanted to save Nietzsche or something from from being just impossible. Uh, maybe that doesn't happen in the end, but at least I, I was happy to find it. Like, oh, it's a very Nietzschean kind of experience here to discover there's there there are these group of people so far away to the left uh, of, of what I would expect defending these passages here. And it was, it was very very interesting. And, and what they're defending is the sense that identity is a important tool in empowerment it's an important tool in self-recognition in a way in some ways you could follow this kind of path you have here for the virtues in Nietzsche so identity could be mapped onto curiosity about the world how you fit in honesty be honest what your position is courage pathos of distance solitude this could all still be in the name of some kind of yeah. identity yeah. Identity. Cour courage could be really own your identity you know yeah and, right. and then you say, but the, the next turn in Nietzsche and how you follow some of these groups, including the Kambahi River Collective, or right. sort of you know, who sort of take some of this dog and, and then realize also in a really productive way, identity can become a limitation or maybe even, I'm not sure if that's too strong a word, a trap or something like that. And I do think there's something that we all experience, at least I experience this, I think, you're given an identity, you liberate this from oppression, from stigma, from shame and all this. And then you end up having another set of expectations that may or may not be the previous ones or a new set of expectations. And those expectations become too rigid. Yeah, I think, I think again, the reasons these chapters turned out to be so long and there ended up being so few of them as, as opposed to the original conception was because to follow Nietzsche's thinking require, required time. And I kept saying throughout the book, every time we get to a dangerous moment, when we're starting to cringe or like want to stop reading, that's the time to slow down. And Nietzsche's motto is lento, lento, go you know, slow, slowly. Um, I think a lot of that comes from his philological training, but that's, that's another point. But um, uh, about identity, I, I kind of lost the train of thought. Um, well, th that identity is sort of, it's a useful tool. Oh. And it, our system is set up already, you know, yeah. to recognize certain identities to, in some ways, protect them because the idea of constitutional democracies is to protect the interests of minorities over the tyranny of majority, et cetera. But the tool becomes kind of, can be turned against itself. It's not in the name of, and this is what right. your whole tenor of your book, it's a name of affirming life yes. and, and and creating more of an abundance within life. It actually takes recourse to something that then starts to stand outside of life. And it's a concept or a category, and it starts to be more and more removed from the actual lived yeah. experience. That's exactly right. And, and, and Nietzsche makes this point. He makes, he makes, several very complex subtle points about identity and that that is one of them is that uh, identity formations identity concepts and labels aren't given in life they're given in you know the herd or they're given by the state yeah. two formations that he's he well you know he hates you know he thinks are very very problematic 
the over, overly determining of the, the person, the subject. They define what subjects are, which ones are permitted, which rights, and they do this largely through identity categorization. But Nietzsche makes that point. He, I think another aspect of it is, yeah, he's strange in a way in that he um, he's, he's very he's very much wants to develop the individual, wants the individual to learn how to develop him or herself. Uh, but in the service, I think of going back to a social formation, and he thinks that as long as we operate within tight identity formations, we're, we're just never going to be able to do that. We're never going to really be able to know who we are because it's already given to us through the prescriptions that come along with whatever the identity formation is. There's always ideologies associated with that. Where there's an ideology, there's always subject formation strategies, and that keeps us locked in. And do you think that there's a way out of this? You sort of, you know, you, you reference... But this book is not a full discussion, but you reference people like Kimberly Crenshaw, the idea of intersectional identity, which is trying to at least break open and resist this idea that an identity that's foreclosed and that there has to be a horizon for an identity to evolve into something yet unimagined. Like Otherwise, you know, we're just locking in my rights as this person right now. And what if in 20 years I, I, I need other rights because my life has evolved? I think that's great. Like the unimagined is very much what Nietzsche is about. He's he's writing for a future, really, and he he he, he says I myself am immersed in, in 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 nihilism because my culture, the very soil is nihilistic. Uh, you know, you know, God, you know, God still is still projected onto the the caves of my my, you know, my my life. Um, I can't figure this out. It's something unimaginable at the point, but I can start getting us thinking about it. And I think he would completely endorse the idea of intersectionality. He might even want to go further with it. We are multiple identities, not only multiple identities like as subject positions within a world, but also very kind of psycho, psychologically or psychoanalytically. There are many selves in us, many, um, many forces vying for, for dominance and and um, um, he, he talks about the, the self, you know, you know, he's very against the idea of an atomistic self. They think that's part of the problem that we're, we're facing is that we have, and that's part of the problem of identity formation is it assumes a kind of essentialized atomistic self. But again, if you go into solitude and you do a certain kind of honest, curious, and inve courageous investigation, you're going to discover there's an awful lot going on inside of you that that that, that might not not be um, be able to be so easily labeled. Well, and there's some things going on, and there he he comes out of Schopenhauer, anticipates Freud, some things we don't want to know about ourselves, and attachments, which which is the the whole project of Foucault is basically we are attached to structures that don't benefit us not necessarily oppression, but that's just because our attachments are unconscious to us. But I like I, to put a point under this identity question, so two terms you've used in the beginning, you said the word masks. Mask comes up quite a lot, and his first, first book is on birth of tragedy, which is really about, you know, performance, Dionysian right. performance. Yeah. But I'm curious how you make sense of this, this idea that Nietzsche keeps on saying, I'm wearing these masks. And this other emphasis you have in the book on embodied knowledge or the body, because in some ways I seem are they, when I hear mask, I'm I'm thinking a little bit, and I'm you know too simplistic here in my mind. I'm thinking, oh, is this just we are performance of ourselves? But the body is not quite a performance of a self. I, I think that's a, a a big distinction in Nietzsche. I, I put it kind of in. I think, I think this might this might fall under this distinction between culture civilization and culture. But there's something about the civilizing process that turns us into these kinds of masked identities, masked entities of necessity. But there's something about culture, which is life. And he 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 he, 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 he talks about life. He gives a very succinct uh, this definition of life. He says, life alone, that dark, driving, insatiable, self-desiring power. Um, that's that's the body is is ultimately that it's it's prior to any kind of masking. I know my my daughter when she had a she was she, she had she has a seven month uh, old baby, and she actually said that you know before 
before she gave birth, you know, you work with a, a doula and, you know, you make all these plans about what's going to happen in the birthing room if X, Y, Z ha happens. And she's like, she, she said, giving birth, <laughs> she said, it was purely animalistic. All of these rationalized strategies were completely out the window. It was really? just, like, yes, it was just like pure animal. Nietzsche, think, he doesn't think we can somehow beat your animals. We've developed rationality. We've developed certain certain capacities over time. We can't get rid of them. We can't go back, uh, but we can we can do things to reestablish or or to um, you know I don't know re re incite re reawaken certain more instinctual aspects of ourselves. It's interesting, and I think some debates that are sort of roiling, you know, sort of people today sort of debates over trans rights and these debates, which in some ways were not settled by even, you know, fifth wave feminism, say, or, you know, there's, 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 there's questions. And I think Nietzsche can help to sort of at least sort of show some of the factors that go into this. So Paul Preciado, you know, who's a yeah. filmmaker, philosopher, he said, I, I'm asking for something beyond identities and subjectivities. Yeah. I didn't ask for adoption and marriage rights. They're great, they should be there, we should have equal rights, but this is not the point. And I think something- We, did, we just did a testo junkie in one of my classes. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And it's, I, and it's, it's quite interesting what he says. He says, these rights that we take, that we, that we should all have, that adoption, et cetera, self-determination, medical care, but they're not necessarily the only goal here. There's a, there's also an unscrambling of the other categories that otherwise keep on rearing their head and coming back to undo any progress or undo anything. So in some ways, Nietzsche says, if you don't go to kind of take apart how these other concepts have established themselves, you're gonna just keep on having these small victories, but you will not unscramble the rest because you you haven't really made fully sense of that we have a body or we haven't made sense of that you're performing identities in certain social contexts. And yes. I, I, I'd be curious what you what you think, how, how important is that work, this kind of laying bare the foundations? And do you think it gives you a sense in, in after writing this book, how you felt I made a bit more sense of the original question. So when Mary Barr said, some things are flaring up in the culture, you know, and like when you said, I wonder what Nietzsche would say. Are there things that after writing the book, because it's a very, um, it's a tour de force, what's really, I think, amazing about the book. It's so beautifully written because it's very fluid and you still manage to put Nietzsche's words in flux all the time. It's not stop, big quote, stop. It's not an academic book in that sense. It actually tells a story. So, so are there things that you feel you've made a bit more sense of or you can get your handle on more than you did when you started writing it? Oh, absolutely. I, my my thinking was very affected by by working through this book and and seeing the kind of moves that Nietzsche would would make, and 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 about how he avoided kind of absolutism, for example, like you know, Socrates is is a buffoon and he's like the bane of Western thought, but he's also so important and necessary, you know. And he says this about democracy, it can it can stem tyranny and it gets rid of monarchy and it starts lifting up people who've been left alone. But then it turns into a kind of sanctification and uh, diminishment of the human. And how does he make these moves? And what it, what comes at the end? He, a lot of times this is left open. It's just the process of thinking. And all the events that occurred while I was writing this book, and I was, you know, I have a friend who says I'm an, an uh, uh, an intellectual method actor, that when I'm working on something, I'm constantly like, oh, you know, the, the anarchist answer would be you know, Nietzsche would say, I, I'm I'm thinking like the person. So it was wonderful and dangerous, and I'm sort of a real irritant and annoyance to the people around me to be thinking about Nietzsche or thinking like Nietzsche or what I thought Nietzsche might think like uh, in discussing all the hot issues that arise about about uh, trans. The you know you, you brought up. Um, um, the transgender issue, as I was reading, you know, as I was reading to Nietzsche, it occurred to me he would he would absolutely celebrate the creative experimentation with gender. I mean, that's one of the kind of unexplored, I don't know, unresolved for sure aspects of Nietzsche is is his sexuality and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, 
Um, I, I have a friend who reads a lot of Nietzsche who you know, considers himself asexual. He's like, oh, Nietzsche's a total, it is obvious that he's like, he's like me, you know. Uh, he, he would, but he's also, as you intimated, I think he would be a little skeptical about just re-inscribing you know, hard uh, identity markers on ourselves after we've done this opening creative experimental work. And then, and it's if someone identifies and say, "This is how I see myself," and I find this in Nietzsche, Nietzsche would say, "Of course you will," and someone else will as well, who's not like you at all. <laughs> yeah. So, it's not that he gives you the answer, and in some ways, I assume asexuality is a way to get out of some categories rather than to add another category to the list and say, "I'm locked in this now forever and ever," and. You guys have a way of defining sexuality. I'm not part of it. Maybe we have to redefine all of what sexuality is, for example. And that's yeah. which which has been the process of a hundred and you know several hundred years. Or, so, or, or Nietzsche might even say maybe even question the very the very notion of it. Yeah. Maybe it and turns out to be a kind of dogma that has overdetermined our thought. That there's in a way over overdetermines and underdetermines that it's sort of this thing that we live, it's half instinct, it's culture, it's it's regulated, it's supposed to be both in and out of our control. And in some ways, Nietzsche says, what is this? As if we're saying hunger is the biggest thing that we actually do. And you know, and Roxane Gay has written a book on shame and hunger, but in some ways to say hunger is how you define everybody. People are very hungry all the time, people are not so hungry all the time. This is it, as if we're making one thing of the human into the thing that matters most. Yeah. You, know, or you could say musicality. Some people who are very musical, this is actually the height of civilization and people yeah. who can sing it too. I think, I, I think Nietzsche would say morality plays that role in our society. That's why he says, I want to question the, the one thing that no one's questioned, and this is why he's the philosopher you know, that thinks beyond good and evil, is he wants to question the the very the very possibility, the very notion of morality itself, and that's never been permitted as the defining aspect of the human as opposed to the animal and so forth. And you, as the human, as kind of the achievement of the human itself is to have moral codes or develop moral standards. And Nietzsche, you walk us through that in the book. He doesn't exactly say there is no moral, there are no truth, or there is no morality. But he says what we've been sold as morality is actually. Uh, not even bad, it's worse than bad because it pretends to be absolute, ever-changing, etc. And in some ways, they are, you could say Nietzsche is really complicated as a thinker because he opens up the West to thinking, what are all the things we have oppressed, denied, deliberately forgotten, obscured, refused to acknowledge? And then, so it opens that up, but Nietzsche doesn't exactly say, and therefore, oh, we find the better version in these other places, which is how yeah. a lot of Scholarship goes, oh, it's, it has to be a turn to another way of knowing, and that'll be the answer. And Nietzsche says, well, that'll be another way of looking at it. It's not going to necessarily be the answer. Yeah, and it, it, it's important to, if, you know, for listeners to, to consider this, that um, I think the case can be made you know, that, that Nietzsche is not just his perspectivism and that move that you just described isn't just kind of evasion, like, like you know, like eternal the de deference of a value and meaning and opinion like bad, bad postmodernism sort of everything yeah is yeah, they yeah exactly it. no, there's it's no like ground. A, yeah. yes yeah. it's not an infinite relativism it's, it's just kind of work that needs to be done before you take a position and you might take a position and it might and it won't be forever because new information will come in and your new experience and so forth and you'll change a position but it's part of the response the doing it's the it's it's the response it's our responsibility to do this kind of work before we take position. That's his his problem in intellectual uh, conscience uh, passages that people don't take this trouble. And I want to give an example. I, I I really it really surprised me when I read this because I was reading this this section where he's like eviscerating the notion of a soul. It's like God, this is just awful, and you know he's given all these reasons, and you're you're ready to like fight with them and go pick it, you know the the soul people, and and then, and then he says something like, then he says, now he says now the way to new versions and refinements and refinements of the soul hypothesis stands open to us after he's done this deep critique. He's like, he says, and concepts like mortal soul, which sounds like a contradiction, right? And soul as subjective multiplicity 
and soul as the social structure of drives and affects want henceforth to have citizenship in the sciences and humanity. So I think Nietzsche is very much a philosopher of the traversal. Like, uh -huh. you, like, like you said about curiosity, it's not just for critiquing and destroying. It's to begin this traversal over into an, an, another, another, another vantage point, another view. Uh, it might be the view of the same thing. Uh, just let me quickly mention this Zen idea that kept coming to mind as I was reading Nietzsche. The idea is before awakening, mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. During awakening, mountains are not mountains and rivers are not rivers. After awakening, mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers, but of course not in the same way. Because they some some you realize something about the nature of language and representation and emptiness. When you look at a mountain, you understand a mountain differently. And yet it's still important since it's still a mountain. So at the end of it, Nietzsche still he's working with democracy and Socrates and the soul and all of these things that he's performing deep critiques on. Because he's seeing also their, I almost said their utility, but Nietzsche does not like utility. Yes. You totally talk at all, but he seems to say their value, their use of you, possible you just, value. You just gave us this example from, I guess, is this a sort of a Buddhist example from awakening? How yes, you go through a process of, in a way, disenchantment or something, and then you go to another deeper enchantment or deeper immersion or something like that. And then, you know, you've translated the Dhammapada, you've written on the life of the Buddha in Buddhism and a kind of critique of facile appropriations of Buddhism. But I'm curious how whether you think how your own path goes from you, you started reading Nietzsche when you, know, you were a teenager, like many people, um, in search of a kind of in in a, in a, in a the, 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 the Zarathustra is the gateway text to Nietzsche, yeah. The gateway text, and in a good way, and in a, it's an interesting gateway text because it keeps on saying, I'm not the prophet that you're looking for. I'm actually going to be laughed out of town and the people won't get me. And you're not so different from the people. And you're and in some ways, your own process, having gone through, starting with Nietzsche, then going through a very serious engagement with Buddhism. And you do show in the book that Nietzsche was... Uh, first through Schopenhauer, but then through his own colleagues, really interested in the kind of Western engagement with, you know, Eastern thought. He, of course, was critical of Buddhism because, um, and he, Nietzsche gets criticized because you will criticize things that people say, like, there's no way you really studied that in depth, like Kant or or the Upanishads or Buddhism. Uh, but I, when I, or, or anarchism, he says some very nasty things about socialists and anarchists. But Having read, you know, socialist, anarchist, Buddhist literature, I, I'd like to say he somehow really hits a nerve. You know, mm -hmm. like he, he, like his interest in Buddhism has to do with the denial of life, the denial of desire, denial of the body, asceticism, and that sort of thing. So he gets some some things very, very, very right there. Uh, I I also noticed that, um, especially in Zarathustra, there's a lot of talk in nausea as an actual important value. And it, the whole time it reminded me of this Buddhist idea of that the path begins with what the Buddhists called Nibbida, which could be translated as nausea. That would be a poetic translation. It's more has to do with a kind of deep disenchantment with the world. And 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 so Nietzsche says something like the path in Zarathustra begins with 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 kind of nausea. And of course, it reminds me of, of the existentialists as well. But that's an important trait because it starts opening our eyes to things. It also has bodily, visceral reaction to, to our situation. Um, yeah, I, um, I, 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 I think like just to, to stay with that. So this Buddhist concept is a disenchantment, or sort of, but it it shows that we attach to a world that's not real to us, and in some ways we can get to another place, right? So it's this nausea leads to some place. So in some ways. There's both the curiosity, the awe that's the beginning of philosophy, or the kind of saying the world as I have been it's been presented to me is not it's not right. There's a better way of doing it, right? So there's a kind of impulse to see yourself more honestly, or what's the you know what is this nausea or this kind of disenchantment? If you're thinking about today, well, a lot of people are saying I can't do the news anymore. I don't want to deal with things. It's so complex. They're withdrawing from the world. What would Nietzsche say to that? He would call that passive nihilism. 
a no. kind of resignation and depression and like yeah. it's, it's impossible to kind of the, the the what's it called the uh the the the, the argument from futility is, is a, a passive nihilist argument that nothing can be done mm -hmm. it elapse into what another fa favorite Nietzschean word nar narcotization narcotization yeah. beer drinking and taking drugs and entertaining ourselves and so forth um the yeah the but it's interesting you could passive nihilism. It's not just nihilism. There's no meaning in the world, but saying, I'm going to resign myself to this, which is for him also a misunderstanding. It's so interesting. He says, he's been you know, accused for a long time as being a nihilist. He said, no, I'm not a nihilist. I'm just a diagnost I'm diagnosing what the world is. And he's, he's saying like, um, I'm trying real hard not to be a nihilist, but there's something about my culture, the very atmosphere I'm breathing that, 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 it's forced me to express things in a nihilistic way. It's, it's kind of, it's Nietzsche, Nietzsche believes that the, our nihilism is, is so deep and so pervasive that it's not merely a question of, uh, we can't just wish ourselves, will ourselves to new values and new ways of being. Like what were you saying about other wor another world? Yeah, that's very important to Nietzsche, but it will always be this world still. I mean, he's very much nowadays considered a philosopher of eminence. He's, you know, he's, he, as you know, he's very against other worlds. Uh, he's, yeah. he's very much thinks that's profoundly problematic. Uh, that this is our world and this is the only world we have, but it can be, it can be transformed through what he calls a reevaluation of values. Um, we can create, and he says. So he says this about morality. He says, like people who study morality, they they should see immediately that their morality is not what they say it is. It is, it is not this code that somehow derived from the you know the the structure of the cosmos, the logos or whatever, but rather that it's something that they've created. And the way they can see that so easily is just look around and see how there are so many other moralities at any given moment, and that morality changes all the time. And but I think so, that, that's really useful for people today, where we see. You know, all politicians have always been engaged in this, but they're promising liberties, self-determination, protection, safety, freedom, democracy, while doing pretty much the opposite. And Nietzsche would say, don't be disturbed by this. Don't be alarmed by this. Just try to understand what they're promising and why they use the same word for meaning apparently opposite things. And you can actually do the work yourself to understand this is not this what they mean by liberty has nothing to do with what is meant by freedom in another sense. So what they mean by democracy is a, a, a completely misguided and deceptive way of misunderstanding equality and erasing difference. So in some ways, I think he gives you some tools, not that the answer is here, but to say, at least I can see what's happening to me rather than becoming a passive nihilist or you know, um, our next revolutionary he says everything is screwed and I'm going to, you know, you know, destroy the whole world. For what purpose? I, I think I think that's, you know, that that's that's the important. That's why I wrote this book, because I think he's offering us tools to do to think our way through our situation towards what who knows. But there, there's an, there's an affirmative, optimistic aspect of Nietzsche that is, since the world is constantly in flux and since things are changing all the time, that means they they can change yet again and they will change yet again. It's a question of who will do the changing and what values these people will have. And that's why he does this work of trying to create you know, the free spirit, the new philosopher and so forth. Is that the person who can start, can start thinking through this and modeling it and talking to others about it and maybe have an influence on the world. But I think, you know, in a nutshell, that's why I wrote this book, and I hope people read it, because I think Nietzsche offers us tools for doing this kind of work. Well, and I think it's a it's an unusually optimistic kind of energetic book that deals with very some of these very controversial and you know provocative topics, and and sort of says, look, and I'm not making Nietzsche easy for you, but it's also not the heavy Nietzsche of academic philosophy, who is really valuable and important, of course, or uh, the proto-fascist who is sort of, you know, shown in movies to sort of say he has these kind of fantastical and, you know, disturbing images, or he's the liberator of the left and embraced by, you know, radical feminists and, you know, anarchists. He's, he's saying it's, there is your own Nietzsche in this book somewhere, 
But the thing not to forget, he's not a negative thinker. And I think this is where you would, you know, there's a kind of honesty in that book that Nietzsche would have been really misunderstood as the great, the end of Western metaphysics or Western philosophy. And, you know, opening the opening the path to then contesting ideologies and, the, the, the you know, made the, the, what is it, what doesn't make you, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger kind of thing. This is not what Nietzsche is really about. No, no. Um, yeah, he, he, he says too, he says, people seem to forget that there was a first part to that saying, which was like the the militaristic ethos, you know. He's not, he, he he's like he's disavowing it. He's like I'm not even saying this myself. Um, yeah, I I say several times in the book, like if you're reading Nietzsche for some sort of answer to this complicated question of whatever democracy is, it, you know, or identity, you're you're just you're just going to cause trouble for yourself and for Nietzsche as well. Uh, he's not he's not a guru. He's not like a, a pundit that way. But but if you're looking to him to start figuring out how we might think through these matters, well, then there's, there's an awful lot there. I yeah. tell you, my first serious academic engagement uh, with Nietzsche, it was supposed to be serious, but I was so clueless. It wasn't. I mean, I was trying my best to hang on. So the professor Stanley Cavell taught a course when I was in college. It was a graduate course. And I kind of figured out to get into this class and it was on Heidegger's reading of Nietzsche but it was really on Nietzsche's reading of Emerson which was really a class about Stanley Cavell and I still have the notebooks and I, yeah. I didn't understand anything at all and I wrote down everything I just would sit there and write and write that. because because I couldn't really follow and I thought I might as well write it down to sort of maybe I'll look at it later but it very profoundly shaped my understanding of what could be self-reliance as a creative act of actually thinking in relation with others rather than this self-sufficiency. And it was a beautiful class. And it's and it, it that class also had kind of this spirit of this is an important thinker for our time. It was really, and it was a really nice way of thinking about it, but it's all deferral. And that's my, my question leads to that. So, you know, I was sent from Nietzsche to Emerson Mm. And we just edited a collection of Emerson's essays and my teacher held Bloom, you know, we got an essay by him on Agon and Emerson as the introduction. What's your next book? So who's your next author, do you think, after you've now wrapped up your Nietzsche and it's going to yeah, be... Yeah, it's interesting to ask that. I mean, you know, Nietzsche, by the way, as you know, like uh, Emerson is one of the people he has only praise for. Yeah. Kurt, uh, Emerson. Uh, I've long been fascinated by mysticism. There's a beautiful... English 13th century mystical text called The Cloud of Unknowing that I've always wanted to look into further. It involved a kind of translation. It's a, an older form of English in that I love texts that I have to translate because it gets me really, really close to the text. That's why I translate all these, these Nietzsche passages to really to really get close to what he, he was saying. Uh, but it's interesting that reading through the proofs of this book recently made me really, really want to keep working with Nietzsche. So I, now all of a sudden, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, no, really? <laughs> yeah. I thought, oh, my God, there's so much here. It's so rich. It feels so good. I was feeling myself. By the time I got to the chapter on the sense of humor, I was feeling myself so encouraged. I mean, it totally <laughs> inoculated me against my own passive nihilism. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I can't even do that anymore if I try. But it's and, funny. It's, it does, I do think that, like, you know, we've known each other for so long. Obviously, it's like it's the book is uh, like it's a nice book to see to have awakened you to something. And like it, it happens with writing, right? Like you actually awaken to a kind of energy and enthusiasm. The writing is very energetic. Um, Nietzsche would probably say, stop it, Glenn. Stop reading <laughs> Nietzsche. Do the cloud <laughs> of unknowing. Do something yeah. else. Nietzsche would yeah. say that you have to turn, take a walk, go outside into the mountain air. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, there's an unexplored aspect of Nietzsche is is esotericism. Like the, 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 some people, I, I've I've read. Uh, I don't think it's been fully developed. But there's a kind of an esoteric Nietzsche here. Like he's constantly saying, you know, we and like you know, winking his eye. You know, we Hyperboreans, we new philosophers, we free spirits. And uh, yeah, sometimes I thought, you know, maybe uh, delve more into that kind of esoteric aspect of Nietzsche that fuses with the yeah it's bizarre to say to say that Nietzsche might have a kind of mysticism going on I don't know if I want to say that but yeah it's the mysticism of of Emerson you know it's, yes. the kind of, it's yeah. a kind of deep a deep awareness of ourselves that is in a strange way leads to self-knowledge truth 
of something unknowable. That there is this kind of, you know, what does he say? Like you have to have chaos in you to bur to birth a uh, dancing star. This yeah. is very much Emerson that we can know ourselves and what we ultimately know is that we don't know ourselves, but that's a really big step. And it's not the kind of Aristotelian, what do, you don't know. It's not that, it's not the beginning of philosophy. It's the beginning of something else, I I think, in Emerson. Yeah, I, 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 I think you're right. I also hear Nietzsche tell me to just stop, you know. <laughs> but you, <laughs> I don't know. So we have um, Nietzsche now, the great immoralist on the vital issues of our time by Glenn Wallace, it's out from Warbler Press now. So uh, congratulations on congratulations on this beautiful book, really incredible. And I'm really happy that you made me um, reread all of Nietzsche's quotes that I've been reading for such a long time, and they somehow came to life in a new way. I appreciate it. And thanks for finding some new typos. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They're well, endless. They're fixed, are endless. They're fixed now. So, um, and then uh, for listeners, you know, Glenn Wallace has been a guest on the Think About It podcast on Khalil G. Brown's The Prophet, which I made him reread after a long hiatus from adolescence to today. Um, and as the other references we had, um, H.L. Mencken was discussed by Ruth ben Giat on especially strong men and sort of the threats to democracy. Michel Foucault was discussed by Anne Stoller. Immanuel Kant, I have a podcast with the amazing and wonderful Beatrice Longness, who teach, talks about Kant. Uh, Melanie Schwartzberg on Rousseau. So there's a whole host of podcasts in this venue, but I'm really happy, Glenn, that you made me... Um, put Nietzsche on the, uh, into the mix here. It's a, it's, a, it's a really wonderful book. Congratulations. I really appreciate it. Thank you, really.